my name is Kelly Bell. I'm the dietitian at the Nemours team. Uh, today we're going to talk about nutrition with SMA. In general, with nutrition, especially with pediatric nutrition, our main focus is to make sure that we are growing. We want our kids to be growing nice and healthy. It gives us that platform and foundation in adulthood so that we can have a better quality of life. Uh, we can also, we're looking for weight maintenance, a healthy weight balance, not being underweight, not being overweight. This also gives us the opportunity for optimal physiological function. Uh, we can prevent some illnesses this way, we can recover faster from illnesses this way. And with the new treatment plans out there, that might give you the extra benefit. So when we're thinking about pediatric nutrition, we're thinking about the different stages of our childhood. In the very beginning stages, there's rapid growth, so we want to make sure we're meeting those growth marks. We're also learning feeding skills. So we want to make sure that as we are progressing to the different stages of feeding, we're able to, to do that. With SMA, we can have some challenges with the muscle weakness. So we're watching for these things to make sure we're getting adequate nutrition, but we're also making any steps we need to adapt to these things. When you're at your care plan, your team meeting, the dietitian's going to be watching. Earlier years, we're going to be meeting with you every three to six months or so, and we're watching to see what these growth markers are. Are we meeting these growth markers? Uh, we're going to be taking measurements. Anthropometrics is the fancy way of saying we're taking your height, we're looking at your weight. If height is a challenge to take, there's other measurement techniques that we can do as well to, uh, to see how we can really assess are we growing the way we want to grow? Uh, we're also looking to see different physical qualities. Um, my therapy team's working on our kiddos. It's an awesome opportunity. I start to watch and see how is the movement, how does the skin look. I look at nails as well, uh, eyes, mouth, to see if there's any nutrition deficiencies that might be there. Uh, you don't really know I'm doing that, but I am watching for these things to see if there's any kind of concern we may have to uh, do any kind of adaptive supplementing to make sure we're getting the right nutrition. Uh, we are looking for balance with nutrients because you can underdo it, you can overdo it. So we want to make sure that we're getting the right balance based on the needs of that individual. And bone health is something that's a big focus. We want to make sure because with SMA we have some muscle weakness, we want to make sure those bones are staying nice and strong. The muscle actually attaches into the bone. So when that muscle is activated, it pulls at the bone, which then signals for the bone to get stronger and to become more dense. With that, the nutrients are going to pull into the bone and make a nice, strong bone. We want to make sure we have the nutrients there to be able to do that. And if we have a weaker muscle, we may have to get other disciplinary teams involved, like endocrinology, to help make sure we're getting a strong bone. So our goal with nutrition, we want to make sure we're getting growth. Now this is our growth chart with our CDC. There is no SMA growth chart for us to compare things to. So when we're looking at the growth charts, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're expecting a child with SMA to land on a specific spot on the chart. But we do want to see uh, certain trends. So as we're taking series of time measurements of height and weight and the proportion of the two, we're going to be watching to see where it falls on the chart and how it's moving across our time to make sure we're growing well. Uh, we want a balance of healthy weight. So we can be underweight or overweight. Those two areas can be problems when it comes to having spinal muscular atrophy. We want to find a good balance so that we have a healthy weight and we can really promote the best outcome for each child. There's other labs we might look at as well. There's other tests that we're going to do. Uh, vitamin D lab test, it's a quick blood draw. We'd look to see what kind of vitamin D levels we have. We can also check to see our DEXA scan, which is looking at our bone density. It also gives me a picture of what kind of uh, percentage body fat we have. So I can see how much lean body mass, how much body fat we have, and get an idea of where we're, uh, where we're designed there with the body. Uh, there's other types of panels we can do. The essential fatty acid profile, if there's any kind of low fat diet in this child, we can see if we're getting enough fat to make sure that we have 
everything we need to promote good brain health and good growth there. Uh, if I'm listening to some of our dietary intake and I notice there might be other nutrients that are deficient, we might be able to do tests on those things too. Uh, many parents choose to do a vegan type of diet and a true vegan diet without a supplement, we might be short on vitamin B12. So that's a test that we can look to see if we're getting enough there or if we need to supplement further. Uh, there's also side effects that can happen when we go on medications or other supplements. So some medications we'll pay attention to to see if we need to make sure we're getting other nutrients as well. Energy balance is what we're looking for too. Each and every one of us have a different profile of how much we need to maintain our weight. If we're running around a lot today, we're going to need more nutrition, more energy than if we're sitting and listening to all of our speeches today. We want to get that right energy balance so that we can maintain that healthy weight, avoid becoming overweight, and avoid becoming underweight. There's macronutrients we're paying attention to. These are the carbohydrates, the proteins, and the fats, which we'll get into in a little bit further. There is uh, not enough published research out there where there's any one optimal diet for spinal muscular atrophy. So with that being said, many parents decide to do uh, specific types of diets. The dietitian wants to support the diet that you're on and make sure that we're getting everything that we need with it. Everything though that we do for um, an SMA patient is going to be individualized because we don't have as much information as we would like to have to really point in one direction or another. So we try to individualize everything. It's very important to do a sick plan. And we don't plan on getting sick, we don't want to get sick, but in the event that it does happen, we want to make sure that we're getting adequate nutrition. So this is showing you what would happen to our body if we're starved. And when we're sick, we don't like to eat. So with this, your body isn't taking in enough nutrition, or it might not be taking in any nutrition, depending on how badly we're feeling. And the body's going to use our stores to convert that into energy to be able to fight off the sickness and try to get better. We go uh, off of our macronutrients. So we have carbohydrates stored in our body. Our liver contains glycogen, and that's just kind of a packaged up sugar and it's going to break that down into sugar. And that's gonna fuel our brain, our spinal cord, that's gonna give us some energy. But we have a limited amount of this. There is some in the muscle. The muscle usually just supplies the muscle, though, so it doesn't necessarily go to the rest of the body. What would happen, though, is after about 24 hours of fasting, in any person's body, we might start breaking down that muscle. That helps to release some of that glycogen it also helps to take the protein in that muscle and convert it into energy. We do have stored fat, but we're finding with some studies that if we have lower muscle mass, we might be at risk for hypoglycemia. There might be some sort of metabolic problem with taking our fat and using that for energy. So fasting is something we really want to avoid as much as possible. If we're in a situation where we have a patient with SMA, we're in a hospital setting, we're sick, maybe we're at home as well. We want to have a plan so that we have some sort of nutrition and we're not fasting for too many hours. With our macronutrients, protein is something that's very important, especially in our growing years. Protein is going to give us the, the uh, fuel and nutrition that we need to recreate, to grow, and to regenerate our tissue. So we want to make sure that we're getting enough protein. In a child, uh, typically one to two grams per kilogram of protein is what we need to make sure. Now that starts to get lower as we get older, but this is something that we use to try to maintain that lean body mass so that we're continuing to grow and we're not losing any of our lean tissue or our muscle. We want to make sure we're getting adequate amounts so that we can promote that continued growth. Uh, there's different sources that you can have with protein, and that's listed here. So our seven to eight grams per serving, you'll find that in your glass of milk. Uh, if you get a pea protein milk substitute, a plant-based milk, that's actually designed to have the same amount of protein as your cow's milk would have. 
Other milk substitutes are going to be lower. They'll have the same amount of calcium and vitamin D, which is great, but it's going to be lower on the protein. As long as you're getting a total amount of protein to promote growth, you can go with the lower amounts of protein or the higher amounts. There are some SMA patients that when they eat a high amount of protein, and the same thing with fat, we start to find complications with our feeding. Um, that some of that could be because when we have protein and fat in our stomach, it stays in our stomach longer. Our body will start to release hormones to help digest that better. Carbohydrates can pass through it a bit faster. So when your protein, when your fat is in your stomach, we need a little more time just to help break everything down, get it ready for digestion. Unfortunately, when we have things in our stomach, that's taking up some space there, which is also where our breathing organs are too. So there could be some competition there. If you have a very full stomach, now the diaphragm doesn't have as much room to work with. So we could have some breathing discomfort, breathing complications with that. So we might notice that if you actually do lower protein or lower fat, you could have a more tolerance to your foods. That being the case, we still want to make sure that we're getting adequate amounts in so that we can promote this growth. So again, we have to individualize it to really find the right balance for each person. So with fat, this is something that's still very important to make sure that we're getting enough of in our diet. Fat is going to give us energy stores. It's something as a backup plan for us. It's also acting in just a practical manner as padding. We want to make sure that if we do fall, we don't just go straight to the bone, straight to the muscle and get hurt, but we have some sort of padding. It's going to act as insulation too, keeps us feeling warm. So it has some of these practical benefits for us. Our fats are also helping to create cell membranes. So for us to grow and to regenerate the cells, we need some fats to create that structure. So these things are very important to make sure that we have in our diet so that we can continue to have the best outcomes for our general health. Uh, there's some essential fatty acids that are called essential because we cannot make them in our body. We have to get it from our diet. So we want to make sure that we're consuming enough to be able to have some of these roles of that fat does to make sure that we have everything that we need. Uh, the essential fatty acids are your omega-3s, which have been marketed a bit more. People are really hearing about these. Uh, your omega-6s as well. So some food sources are listed here, um, making sure that you're getting some of these in your diet. The omega-6s, we tend to get enough, but the omega-3s sometimes can be very lacking in our diet. And this tends to help with inflammation too. It helps to reduce inflammation. So that can be a benefit as well to give us that overall healthy picture. Uh, some diets that are out there do go low in the fat. And again, that could help when it comes to not getting stuck in the stomach for too long. But we want to make sure we're not going too low where we're risking having a fat deficiency. So whenever I'm looking at a dietary uh, outcome, if I'm looking at any kind of blenderized food program, for example, I do want to make sure I'm getting at least 10% of those calories coming from fat compared to the total calories so that we can have a good outcome of fat balance. Some of the barriers that we find to nutrition. So with our neuromuscular issues, we might have some functional issues when it comes to getting the food into our body. Uh, there could be swallowing and chewing difficulties. This can be very common where we have to make sure we're compensating for that. And we'll go through that for in the next slide. Um, there's competition for space. So as I was saying, there's, the stomach can get full if we have a high protein, high fat uh, intake for that meal. Or maybe we're on some sort of uh, tube feed of some kind, we're taking formula. If there's higher amounts, it might stay in there longer which could then fill up the stomach, could take longer for the stomach to empty. That's what our gastric emptying is. Uh, it could take longer there, so now we're not quite getting that comfort anymore because we're competing for some of the space. Uh, sometimes we'll see some of our patients start to regurgitate, throw up, not be able to tolerate. This is again where the interdisciplinary team can be very helpful, where we can get the, our GI team involved and they can help come up with some solutions too. 
so we can still get the nutrition that we need, but find a way to do it in a comfortable manner. Uh, we also, it's very common to have constipation. Uh, peristalsis slows down. That's the big fancy way of saying those muscles that are on your intestinal cells and the, and the walls there, they squeeze all that food. They keep everything moving down. They could slow down too. They may not be moving things as it should. So we have just the slow down altogether. And now we have, we're facing issues with constipation. If there's a backup in the plumbing, it could get backed up and go up as well. So we want to make sure that we're getting everything moving around the way it should. With swallowing and chewing difficulties, this is something where some of the muscles in this area here, they can be affected by having spinal muscular atrophy. These are some of the muscles that are actually atrophying. So we want to watch to see, are we getting tired with chewing if we're eating by mouth? We want to see, is there coughing going on when we're eating our food? Do you hear a wet sound as we're eating or after eating? Does it sound like there's something stuck? It gives you that kind of wet vocal sound. That could be the food didn't quite clear. And if you notice, there's the <clears throat> going on often, there could again be some issues where the food's getting stuck, not quite going down. We have in this picture here, your esophagus. That's the tube that takes everything from the mouth into the stomach. Right next to that tube is our trachea, which takes the air, brings it into the lungs. They're right next to each other. So if we have any kind of swallowing issues, that food could actually go down the wrong tube, go into the lungs, and now we're facing illness or the risk of illness. And again, we want to plan for sick days, but we don't want to get sick. So swallow studies might be warranted, especially for noticing very early onset infancy symptoms so that we can make sure that we're actually swallowing properly or do we need to make interventions here to adapt to make sure that we're safe. And that swallow study is very beneficial because it's very common. We don't hear any of those symptoms, but the food is going down the wrong tube. So that's called silent aspiration. Aspiration is where it's going down the wrong tube and we just can't see it, we can't hear it. We don't have any indication, so we do a swallow study so that we can find out and know absolute if there's a risk or not. If we find there are some of these barriers happening, there's different alternatives that we can do to adapt, make sure our nutrition is getting in the right way and giving us our best outcomes. So we could modify food, and this is where we can mechanically alter it, maybe have it chopped up a bit more, ground up a bit more, or even puree it so that it's going to be a better outcome with swallowing. And oftentimes with that swallow study, we'll have a speech therapist there. They will be the expert on determining which course of action to take for that. We may have to thicken liquids to make sure that that's going down safely as well. We may have to do supplements to make sure maybe it's just a matter of we can eat, but we can't eat enough to sustain what we need. So now we have to supplement to get the rest of our nutrition the way we need it. That could be in what's called an oral supplement. It's a liquid nutrition. We're drinking it in addition to eating our food. Uh, it could be where we're creating our own oral supplement too. If we find that this is an ongoing issue and we're not able to get enough nutrition in, we may have to go the route of nutrition support. So we do have things where we can do a short-term solution we have a tube that goes from the nose into the stomach. So this, we can still try to eat if we're cleared and it's okay and safe to eat, but we have some sort of formula, some sort of nutrition blenderized solution in a liquid form that can go through that tube, go straight into the stomach. Or it might go past the stomach depending on our situation again. But that's gonna give us the nutrition that we need to over a 24 hour period give us everything that we need to promote adequate health and adequate growth. If we know it's gonna be a long-term situation, this is where we can do a gastrostomy tube, G-tube for short. This is where we do put a small hole where it connects straight to the stomach. You may have a button right here and you connect so you can pour the food straight to the stomach. The nice thing is you don't have to have a tube on your face anymore. 
and you can be very discreet, but you can still get the nutrition that you need if this is the situation. We focus on our bone health, and this is not just a nutrition thing, but with nutrition we want to make sure there's enough nutrients to build that bone. So with that, calcium and vitamin D are the big focus. We're all, I'm going to be looking at uh, vitamin K, magnesium, phosphorus as well, but I tend to find that we're getting those amounts in, in adequacy to make sure we're getting bone health. Calcium, though, sometimes can be a little bit more difficult for us to make sure we're getting enough of. So this is the uh, daily recommendation amount for these age groups for the amount of nutrition that we need for calcium. And here's some food sources. Dairy is most well known for your calcium. However, it doesn't have to be dairy. There's many people who choose not to have dairy. Some people cannot tolerate the dairy. Uh, any milk substitute is designed to mimic the same amounts of calcium and vitamin D that you would have in your regular cow's dairy. Uh, there's other food sources too. The amount that you would typically eat, though, you would notice that is a, a smaller amount of uh, calcium in that food itself. And in some of these foods, there's actually other components in there that interfere with the absorption of the calcium. So in that case, if we can't get it through our food, we may have to supplement with calcium to make sure we're getting enough and getting everything we need to make that good bone health. Vitamin D, it doesn't just help us with our bones, it does many different things. We will be testing for vitamin D, we want to make sure there is adequate levels in the blood. There's some food sources listed here as well, our dairy foods or dairy substitutes. They're going to be fortified with vitamin D to make sure we have enough. The uh, recommended amount is 600 international units daily. Oftentimes, once we start doing tests to see what your vitamin D status is, you may have to be prescribed something higher to make sure we're getting adequate amounts. Vitamin D, when it's in your body and activated, it acts as a coach. It's going to help tell the body to make healthy bones, including telling the body to absorb more calcium. So we want to make sure you have enough vitamin D in your system. Our fluid needs are very important, too. And as Julie mentioned, Sometimes we don't want to drink as much because we have to think about going to the bathroom as well. However, we're going to have very different needs based on our situation. Uh, our fluid needs change based on age. It changes based on body weight as well. And then our condition. If we're having more respiratory distress or we're having to work harder to breathe, we might have uh, more fluid needs as well because we're going to actually be expressing more fluid that way. So we might have increased needs to make sure we're getting enough fluid. Water is something we like best. With fluids, we do include things like your milk or milk substitute. Uh, there is juice as well. However, we want to try to limit that and not be so over and abundant because we want to try and make sure we're eating all of our foods. Uh, we want to make sure juice, for example, if you have the opportunity of having orange juice or a whole orange, if you have the whole fruit, you're getting the fiber with it. So fluid is not only helping to make sure that we're maintaining all of our physiological processes, but it helps with constipation. So if we're getting fiber, we want to make sure we're getting plenty of fluids to help everything balance and help everything flow through. So this is something that's going to be something we'll assess and very likely we'll end up having a higher goal to make sure we're getting fluid needs met. Any questions? Well, thank you. All right, we have one question real quick. We do. Um, when sick, have you, would there be a recommended modified diet? So with fever, not tolerating feeds, would you recommend a modified diet so they're at least getting fluids? Um, or would yes. you just carry through and... Clean up. 
Uh, it's going to be individualized for that as well. So this is something as I'm getting to know each individual um, and also knowing their history too. If we've already had a sick moment and we've had experiences, that's really important to share and talk about. I've had families uh, tell me about certain things where they were in the PICU and they had to go through different feeds, uh, what worked, what didn't. So we want to know those things. Uh, there's no cookie cutter answer to it. I will really, really push in the PICU to make sure we're starting IV fluids that contain a dextrose solution so that we are giving nutrition that way. And then going into a tube feed or some sort of feeding regimen as quickly as we can, as safely as we can. Um, it may be modified, but sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. So again, it's going to really depend on the situation, on the illness as well, on the state of breathing, on the, the stability. Um, so there's really no set answer, but uh, we will try to make sure that we're giving those feeds. Um, and I will say, if there is a feeding regimen already in place, if there is already um, a G-tube or an NG tube involved, uh, or if it's a blenderized feed, there are certain things that sometimes we do have to adapt and uh, either take out or add in to make sure that we're okay in that sick state. Um, our metabolic needs, all of the physiological processes going on, they're very different when we're sick. So we want to make sure that we're feeding to that. I hope that answers your question since I couldn't give you a straightforward one. All right, thanks guys. If you have any more questions, you can ask her during lunch. So give it up for Kelly, guys.